Here with me now is GOP presidential candidate, former South Carolina governor, who's also the former U.S. ambassador to the U.N., Nikki Haley. Thank you so much for being here. Let's start with the U.S. retaliation for that deadly attack on U.S. service members in Jordan. Uh, as the former U.N. ambassador, looking at this uh, retaliation, are you satisfied with the U.S. response so far? Well, I think the first thing is I have to respond as um, the wife of a combat veteran and, uh, you know, one whose husband is deployed right now. We make a promise to our military men and women that we will keep them safe. We make a promise to the military families. We make a promise to them themselves. The fact that nothing was done after the first strike, the fact that nothing was done after the second strike, it took 165 strikes, three soldiers to die, two Navy SEALs, and now Biden wants to do something? The biggest issue is this didn't have to happen. Why did it take so long? So let's go back to what started it. What started it was, first of all, he never should have fallen all over himself to get back into the Iran deal. By doing that, he lifted the sanctions. All the money flowed to all of the terrorist proxies around the region. And now we're paying the price of that. And so you look at what's happened now. First of all, I think he should have done something sooner. But first, Dana, first and foremost, Put the sanctions back on. You got to put the sanctions back on. Now, I appreciate that he did do something. I appreciate that he's gone after the targets of where the missiles and drones are coming from in terms of Iraq and Syria. I appreciate that what he's doing in Yemen. But if you really want to make a difference and you really want to put an end to this, which is what we all want to do, first you put the sanctions, then you go after one or two of the IRGC military leaders that are making these decisions. None of this would happen without Iran. So you Should can that go happen and hit their Iran? you can take out their so what you need to do is if those military leaders are inside Iran, yes, you do it surgically, or if they leave Iran, you take them when they're there. The the bottom line is you can take out some of their fighters, they'll just get more fighters. You can take out their drones and missiles, they'll just get more drones and missiles. What Iran responds to is if you hit their money or if you hit their leadership. That's what we need to be focused on, is making sure we go after that to give them the punch that they need. Your competitor, uh, the, the former president of the United States, Donald Trump, often says how tough he was during his four years in office on Iran. What would you do differently than Donald Trump would do? Well, I worked closely with him to get out of the Iran deal. I mean, I actually went to, um, you know, the International Atomic Energy Agency to study whether the Iran deal was working. And when I asked them the questions, I said, you know, how many of the research areas do you inspect? Because we knew a lot of the nuclear production was happening in the research areas. And they said, we don't inspect those. And I said, well, how many of the military installations do you inspect? Because we knew that that's where the production was happening. They said, well, we're not allowed to inspect the military installations. And I said, okay, then what do you inspect? And they said, well, if we get a tip, we give them 45 days and then we go and inspect. And that's when I came back and told Donald Trump, not only do you have to get out of the Iran deal, it's the responsible thing to do. So they don't keep their promises. They've always said death to America. So Trump was right to get out of the Iran deal. We were right to have the sanctions in place. The problem was the sanctions never should have been lifted. What would you that's do differently what gave than them him all now? of the power. I don't I think I would do exactly the same thing, put the sanctions back on and I would go after the, the Iranian military leadership. That's what we need to do to stop what's happening in Lebanon. That's what we need to do to stop what's happening in Yemen and the Red Sea. That's what we need to stop what's happening in Iraq and Syria. This will escalate. That's the problem is this is going to escalate. And none of this had to happen. They wouldn't have happened if they wouldn't have had the money to do it. Let's turn to the crisis at the U.S. southern border. Bipartisan negotiators in the U.S. Senate, they're set to release the text of a deal on border security soon. Donald Trump, as you know, is pushing Republican senators to oppose the deal, in part because he wants to run on the issue in 2024, in this election year. You called that a mistake. Are you saying that the former president is playing politics with the border? Well, I think nobody should be playing politics with the border. First of all, he shouldn't be getting involved telling Republicans that wait until the election because we don't want this to help Biden win. We can't wait one more day. You have millions of people who've come to that border. They are not being vetted. America's acting like it's September 10th. We better remember what September 12th felt like because it only takes one. This is not a time to play politics. Is he? What I do think is they need to get something out. Of course he is. He's absolutely playing politics by telling them not to do anything. 
But what I do think they need to do is they've got to put a tough immigration law in place. I mean, right now, I don't know what the text is, but from what I understand, it doesn't include Remain in Mexico. We need to have Remain in Mexico. That's actually very important to make sure that they never step foot on U.S. soil. And now I hear some Republicans saying, oh, but we don't need a law at all because Biden could do this already. Well, there's some truth to that, and then some of that is false. Yes, Biden could go back to some of the laws that put it in place, but three million illegal immigrants came under Trump. And that's because the asylum laws are not strong enough. So we need to strengthen the asylum laws so that we don't have people coming in here for loose reasons. And that's the only way we're going to get this under control. We've got to start. We've got to defund sanctuary cities. We've got to put 25,000 Border Patrol and ICE agents on the ground. We need to go back to remain in Mexico. And we need to, instead of catch and deport, we need to, instead of catch and release, we need to do catch and deport. We've got to put an end to this. And we've got to do it now. Uh, on a related topic, this week you told radio host Charlemagne the God that you believe states have the right to secede from the union. Now, I know you've said that is unlikely, uh, but this is a pretty important issue that I want you to clarify as somebody who wants to be president. Do you really think individual states have the right to leave the USA? Well, he was talking about a conversation from um, a dozen 13 years ago, during the time when I was a Tea Party candidate, states were very upset about government control. They were very upset about government spending. They were very upset about the fact that they weren't listening to the people. And there had been a movement that Texas had wanted to secede from the union. And what I said is, when government stops listening, let's remember states' rights matter. You have to be as close to the people as possible. No one is talking about seceding. That's not an issue at all. What we are talking about, the fact is, here you have Governor Abbott and the people of Texas who just want to be kept safe. They're putting up barbed wire to keep people coming in. And the idea that the federal government is wanting to sue them and cut that barbed wire when we're trying to make sure that we keep people out, that's a huge mistake because, one, we want the deterrence so that they know not to make the trek to America in the first place. Mm -hmm. But, two, we also want to make sure that Texans are kept safe. So that's what the conversation was about. You know, I didn't realize this, but the current Texas Republican Party platform that was added in 2022 does call for a statewide voter referendum on whether Texas should, quote, reassert its status as an independent nation. Uh, so I just, again, want to, because this is such a foundational issue, I want to clarify for, for voters, you want to be president of the United States. Do you think that any state has a right to secede? No, according to the Constitution, they can't. What I do think they have the right to do is have the power to protect themselves and do all that. Texas has talk about, talked about seceding for a long time. The Constitution doesn't allow for that. But what I will say is, what's the, where's that coming from? That's coming from the fact that people don't think that government is listening to them. And I've been 400 miles on that border, Dana. You see what those ranchers are going through. You see what those people in Eagle Pass are going through. And now you see what's happening in New York and cities across the country, because now every city is Eagle Pass. We've got to start getting this under control. Texans are frustrated, and mm -hmm. rightfully so. Governor Abbott's frustrated, and rightfully so. When have you ever seen a president President not support a governor when they're trying to keep their people safe. It's a real problem. I want to ask you about uh, one of the issues, the, the trials that Donald Trump is facing, and that is related to the January 6th insurrection. Uh, the judge in that postponed uh, the date of that trial as everybody waits to see whether or not the former president is going to get what he's asked for, which is total immunity from prosecution. Beyond that, though, do you believe that the American people should know whether Trump is going to be found guilty of criminal charges before he is potentially formally nominated at your party's convention this summer? It's a real issue, Dana. I mean, you know, we saw that he had look, he's got multiple court cases. I haven't necessarily kept up with them. I'm not a lawyer. I'm an accountant. So I don't know the legal ramifications. But what I do know is one just came down. He had a big verdict. More than that, we just saw that he, in his disclosures, his campaign disclosures, he just paid 47 different law firms, $50 million of campaign donations that came into his campaign. If you see that, and he hasn't even gotten started on all these cases, for the next year he's going to be sitting in a courtroom. I didn't say that. He said that he's going to be spending more time in a courtroom than he is going to be campaigning. So is it your hope That's that there problem. are verdicts before the convention? 
Well, it's my hope that I think that the American people deserve to know which of these cases are legitimate and which ones aren't. You know, he's going to have another one, I think, in March. I think he's going to have more in April and May. I think the American people deserve to know what the situation's going to be. But, you know, the court system's going to play out the way it is. He has the right to defend himself. But at the same time, you know, I think it speaks for himself that he's saying he's going to be spending more time in a courtroom than he's going to be spending on the campaign trail. We've got a country in disarray and a world on fire. We need a president that's going to give us eight years of focus and discipline, not one that's going to be sitting there ranting about how he's a victim and how, you know, this isn't right and how this isn't just. He hasn't once talked about the American people.